Good morning and welcome to the 21st meeting in 2014 of the Health and Sport Committee. As usual, at this point, I would like to ask everyone in the room to switch off mobile phones as they can often interfere with the committee's business. And saying that, though, uh, I should point out to um, uh, that uh, members and officials are using tablet devices instead of the hard copies of the papers. Um, our first item on our agenda today is a decision uh, on whether to take item 10 in private. Item 10 is our approach paper to the Mental Health Bill. Uh, is the committee agreed that we can take item 10 in private? I yeah. uh, thank you for that. We now move quickly to item number two uh, on our agenda today, which is subordinate legislation, and we have one affirmative instrument before us, the re registration of social workers and social ser service workers in Care Services Scotland Amendment Regulations 2014 draft. As usual with affirmative instruments, um, we will have an evidence-taking evidence session with the Minister and her officials on the instrument. Once we've had all of our questions answered, we will then have the formal debate on the motion, if necessary. Um, can I now welcome uh, the Minister for Children and Young People and her officials, Aileen Campbell, Minister for Children and Young People. Welcome. Um, uh, Minister is accompanied by Diane White, Senior Policy Officer uh, of the Chief Social Work Advisor, and Katie Richards, Solicitor, Food, Health and Community Care Division, the Scottish Government. Uh, and give the Minister an opportunity to make um, a, a brief opening statement. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Convener, and thank you for the opportunity to introduce these regulations made under Section 782 and 3 and 1041 of the Public Services Reform Scotland Act 2010. These regulations amend the schedule to the Registration of Social Workers and Social Service Workers in Care Services Scotland Regulations 2013. The 2013 regulations require social services workers within the scope of registration to register with the SSC, specifically all new workers commencing employment in any of the groups within the scope of registration must achieve registration within six months of commencing employment and set final dates by when existing workers must achieve registration. The draft regulations before you relate to the latest group of workers from whom registration with the SSC will commence in June 2014, namely supervisors working in care at home and housing support services. The provision amends the schedule to the regulations to set the date when existing workers working these services must achieve registration with the SSC. So in summary, convener, the regulations maintain and fulfil the policy intention that registration with the SSC is a prerequisite of employment and continuing employment and provides the final dates of registration for the latest group of workers. So I move the regulations and happy to answer any questions that you or the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you, again. Minister. Do we have any questions for the committee? See Rhoda Grant. I wonder um, if there's a qualification attached to the registration. Is there a minimum qualification that those people need to attain? And if so, how long does it take um, for someone with no previous qualification to get to that, to that level? It does uh, uh, apply with um, qualifications. Um, in terms of the timing, um, there's S Diane, do you want to say it's SVQ level 3 is the, is the level of, of qualification that is, is required. In terms of timing, Diane, would you like to comment? The timing can vary between 12 months to 18 months. It depends on how much experience the worker actually has because their experience goes towards the accreditation of the, obtaining the qualification. But in terms of the regulations that we're laying today, um, there's a, a, a lead-in time up to 2017, so there's a period of time by which workers can be registered, and that closing date is 2017. So there's a, a, a time there for people to gear up to be able to register for this group of workers that we're talking about today. So do you think three years is, is adequate to, well, to allow people to, to qualify? I mean, given that people may not get the certification first time. Well, we 
the original Act was consulted upon and we've put out the draft regulations for consultation and that went to all employers. It went to uh, employees as well, including Unison and other uh, groups and representative groups and there was no comment that came back. So the, the timescale is, 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 I think, you know, uh, doable and achievable for the group of workers that we're talking about and that gives us enough lead-in time to allow uh, employers to have... Um, um, an opportunity to have the right uh, qualifications and also the act was passed in 2010 so there's been not only the time from now to 2017 but it's been since 2010 that this workforce has understood that there will be a requirement for registration. Richard Lyle. Uh, Mr. Can you tell me if the, is there a cost for a registration and uh, is that cost uprated? Uh, is it going to be uprated yearly or is it going to be uprated at, at certain points? Well, the costs depend on the level of um, standard that the person has, so that will be for, for senior managers, it's £30. Uh, for this group that we're talking about today, it's £20. So there are different kind of strands and tiers of, of cost depending on the, um, the, the, the type of person that's registering. Is that a yearly cost? It's a yearly cost, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions from members? No other questions then. We now move to agenda item uh, three, which is a formal debate on the affirmative SSI, on which we have just taken evidence. Um, can I remind uh, the, com uh, the committee and others here that the mem members should not put questions to the minister uh, uh, during this session. It is now, we're now in formal debate. Uh, and, of course, officials uh, may not speak in the debate. Can I invite the minister to move motion S4M, 10400, please. Formally moved. Thank you. Um, do any members wish to participate in the debate? No, thank you. Um, can I invite the Minister? I'll give her the opportunity to sum up. No, she doesn't need that. I then put the question on the motion. The question is that Health and Sport Committee recommends that the registration of social workers and social service workers in Care Services Scotland Amendment Regulations 2014 can be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. And can I thank the Minister and your, uh, your officials for your attendance here this morning. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Committee. We'll just suspend at this point briefly until we set up for <laughs> a, a, item four.
Uh, we now move to agenda item number four, which is to take evidence on the National Health Service Pharmaceutical Services Scotland Miscellaneous Amendments Regulations 2014, SSI 2014-148. Now, I suppose it should be said that it's uh, slightly unusual to take evidence on a negative instrument, but as um, there has been a fair bit of interest, I think uh, everyone would agree on this issue, <clears throat> I thought it would be useful to invite the Scottish Government officials along uh, to answer any questions that members might have. And we appreciate that we have with us this morning uh, Professor Bill Scott, Chief Pharmaceutical Officer, Deputy Director of Finance, eHealth and Pharmaceuticals Directorate, and uh, David Thompson, Deputy Director, Primary Care Division, and Katie Richard, again, um, Solicitor, Food, Health and Community Care Division, Scottish Government. Um, who, who, who was with, who, with us earlier. Um, can we go straight to any questions that members may have? Richard Simpson. Yes. Um, I, I hope that the uh, witnesses will be aware of the questions which I tabled last week in the Petitions Committee, which was designed to give notice of the areas in which I had particular interest. <laughs> Um, I should begin by declaring my membership of the Royal College of General Practitioners and membership of the BMA to remind members that I have a, 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 an interest, though not personal anymore, I'm glad to say, in this area. Um, the, the, my first question really, uh, if I can just say by way of opening remarks, that I think this is our second bite at this. Uh, we changed them in the last parliament. We thought we got it right then, and we clearly hadn't. I th hopefully this time will have got it right. So I very much welcome the new regulations, but there are some issues, I think, outstanding. Uh, the first thing is that the, uh, the new, sen new, sen uh, new concept of protecting remote and rural practices by designating uh, protected localities. Um, I just, uh, if, the, if the witnesses could possibly give us a, a, um, some indication of, of, of the potential definition of this, because that would help, I think, those out there who have got, still got some concerns as to how large or how small this protected locality is likely to be in terms of the Scottish geography, if they, if they could give us a, some further information on that. Thank you, Dr Simpson. I think I'll ask my colleague, uh, David Thompson, to address that. Okay, thanks, and thanks for the opportunity to um, uh, explore the regulations with the committee. Um, first off, I think there, there, there um, is one thing to say, which is that Obviously, with these regulations, we're hoping to address four objectives. We want to enhance the objectivity of the process. We want to give due weight to the effect on a dispensing practice affected by the application. Uh, we want to ensure, ensure that all affected have the right of consultation. And we want to improve access to a pharmacist for patients of dispensing practices. So that's our aim with these regulations. Um, they introduce, the amendments introduce the concepts of a controlled locality, as uh, Dr. Simpson has said. Um, and with the aim for controlled localities, what we're trying to do um, is provide some extra process uh, in the consultation for areas within a health board which are remote or rural in character and which are served by a GP dispensing practice. Um, so that's the, the policy aim behind it. And um, Katie uh, uh, will be able to talk us through the elements of the regulation which help to provide that definition if that's helpful. And the drafting solicitor um, and can help with explaining the effect of the 2014 regulations. Um, the process is quite specific and we believe that it should be readily understood. There's a newly inserted paragraph 1A um, of Schedule 3 to the 2009 regulations, which sets out two requirements that an area must have to be classed as a controlled locality. Firstly, the area has to be remote or rural in character. And secondly, there has to be a dispensing doctor in that area. The terms remote or rural um, are further explained in Scottish Government urban rural classifications and the existence of a dispensing doctor will be a matter of fact. So in that regard, the requirements for a controlled locality are known in precise conditions and dispensing GPs can look at the Scottish Government urban rural classifications to assess the likelihood of their area being classified as remote or rural. In addition, um, paragraph 1A states that once you have identified a particular area as being a controlled locality, the boundary of that controlled locality will be the same as the dispensing doctor's practice boundary. Thank you for that. Uh, hopefully that information will be fed out to in, 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 in more detail, perhaps even in a map or you know a list of the practices that actually would fall within this. So 
every doctor doesn't have to look this up, but actually will be then aware of it. I think, I think uh, it would be helpful to um, reduce the tension that there is amongst dispensing practices, which is very significant if that were something that could be done. Uh, can I have a supplementary on that, uh, uh, convener? Yeah. And that is, at the moment, the proposal is, I think, for the designation to last for three years, uh, except in exceptional circumstances, such as the building of a new housing estate or some substantial development, which might alter the character of the, of the locality. Um, can I say to you, I think, you know, we should remind ourselves that GPs are running businesses. Uh, three years is not a long enough, in my view, not a long enough time for uh, people to be able to plan their businesses ahead. Three years could create uncertainty, except in the very, very remote and rural areas where the likelihood of a change, I think, is probably going to be much more remote as a result of the regulations. But it's that borderline which has been pushed out where we want more pharmacy services, yes, but we've actually affected those practices badly, as the, the Wilson and Barber report indicated in paragraphs 49 to 51 of their report, that they were very concerned about destabilisation. It's that boundary that I would still be concerned about. Uh, so I just wonder why you just settled on three years rather than perhaps five or uh, even, you know, for some areas, a longer designation so that they have certainty in business planning, certainty in investing in the dispensing part of their practice. I can understand uh, that sentiment, uh, Dr. Simpson. When we put the consultation out, of course, uh, the response we got back was from one year and upwards. And um, we chose five years, I have to be honest. Uh, we chose three years um, to get just a balance. And um, this was linked to the pharmaceutical care um, planning that the boards have to do. And in that planning tool, they are reviewing their plans every three years. Thank you. That's a, that's a helpful, helpful explanation. But it, I think it doesn't give comfort to the ones on the boundary in terms of business planning. I, mean, I, I still think that's wrong. I, I, as you know, convener, I didn't move to annul this regulation because I think it's important we get it in quickly. And I think it's a very useful advance. But I do think that that will need to be watched carefully to see if going forward there are going to be considerable tensions on that boundary uh, where the, the, the um, yeah. Yes, um, I, I can say that we will take into account, of course, the points which are made here as we look at um, putting out our guidance. Thank you. Rosa Grant. Thanks, Convener. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Um, the first is um, regarding co-location, where a GP, where a pharmacist wants to co-locate, um, but other pharmacists in the area block that. What um, is the role of the community, if they're supportive in that, how much credence is put on their, their wishes to have co-location? The uh, regulations themselves do not prevent co-location. But uh, when we look at co-location, the regulations look at all applications coming in. And therefore, we have to be aware of maybe some unintended consequences of that, such as <coughs> inadvertently introducing commercialization within the uh, primary care services, financial interests, GPs or others, and um, whether large companies, as we see, who have money to um, go in with industry to build uh, health centres, then apply for the contract. That means that other pharmacies in the high street or around could be affected by that. And in, by affecting them, you then reduce unintended the number of pharmacies, because pharmacies still depend on the prescriptions. Um, we'd also say that um, once a health centre has a pharmacy, if they close at weekends, patients can't get those pharmaceutical services. We found that in a number of places where the pharmacy is within the, the health centre. So, it's not just coterminosity in one aspect. In the regulation, it would apply 
much wider. I suppose what I'm asking is what strength given to the community com community position on this? Because, for instance, if um, the community are keen to have co-location because that makes it easier, say people are travelling a distance, they don't want to then stop and have to go somewhere else to access the pharmacy. Is the, what, what credence is given to the community position if they are keen to have co-location, um, but pharmacists say pharmacies from out with the area are keen to stop that development going ahead because you know people would have normally had to to go to the GP and then travel to another pharmacy some distance away I mean sometimes yeah. the the other pharmacists who are obviously protecting their business um, are given more um, credence in the discussion than the community that would benefit from that. I think the pharmaceutical uh, care services plan, we've asked them to look at the services provided and where they're provided and to match those with the demographic graphics round around. So that is one vehicle where the community can make their representation. Okay, so the community representation would be taken seriously in that? Yes, the, these plans will not be constructed by the boards without taking into account the communities they serve. So they will input into that. Okay. And can I just ask another question? And it kind of turns yes. the, the thing slightly on its head. You know, and I welcome this instrument coming forward because there's lots of issues um, that need to be dealt with. However, my view is that this instrument doesn't deal um, with allowing patients in remote rural areas to access pharmacy services and obviously people want their GP services, want their GP services protected yeah. and don't want a pharmacist if that is going to cost yes. them GP services that they know and enjoy. However, it doesn't deal with the issue that people will benefit if they get access to pharmacy services. So how can we get people in those areas to have access to pharmacy services that doesn't undermine their GP services? OK. Um, the first thing is, as you know, we are um, going to have pharmacists, clinical pharmacists, to support the general practitioners with their patients for reasons of um, helping with complex medicines, complex patients. I think uh, the issues which you may be addressing would be that of the minor ailment service. How, how do you get medicines without having to go to the uh, general practitioner all the time. Um, and I think that's something that we would want to look at uh, in future, how we do that in a way which does not undermine the general practitioner and yet at the same time does not require the community pharmacy to put in an expense which they're not getting a return back on. So yeah, that is work in progress? work in progress. There, there's also the issue of, for instance, people with complex conditions who would benefit from sitting down and speaking to a pharmacist rather than have the GP getting that advice and then getting the advice through the GP who, who themselves could do, you know, benefit from sitting down with a pharmacist, going through their medication and, and kind of tweaking their regime to, to suit their lifestyle. And I think that's very important with long-term conditions and also palliative care. Yes, I agree. And in fact, we've just received um, a project proposal from Western Isles. Uh, we received that yesterday. And we are looking at that because that will help us shape the model um, which will serve these patients in rural communities. Annette Millen. Convener, um, I, I don't have a declarable interest in this, but some years back, my sister-in-law did run a dispensing practice up in the north of Scotland, and I'm aware that, that GPs invest a significant amount in sort of equipment, um, pre re adapting premises and employing staff. Um, if a community pharmacy was then to take over in, in that area, is there any plan to compensate GPs in any way for the, the you know the outlay they may have had in the, in the past? And what, what about the staff that they're employing specifically to do pharmacy work? Would they be transferred to the incoming pharmacy? Or has any arrangement be made about that? I'll ask um, David Thompson to take that. Um, I, I think it's, uh, with your, obviously, GP 
contracts are independent contractors. Um, they're continually making decisions about their own investments. Um, and in fact, in contrast with pharmacy contractors, um, who are responsible for the provision of all infrastructure and staff required to deliver pharmaceutical services, dispensing doctor contractors, um, in addition to the dispensing remuneration they receive, um, also have the cost of premises uh, which they require to provide those dispensing services covered by the health board. So they're already getting um, um, a, a, a potential advantage there. Um, to answer the question, um, if staff were to be made redundant, any redundancy costs would fall to the original employing practice. Um, obviously, that contractor would normally look to redeploy those staff if, uh, if that was possible. Um, and, but we are aware that in practice some staff, as you've said, have also transferred to the new pharmacy where the costs would obviously uh, uh, be borne by the new pharmacist. Um, when a dispensing practice loses its dispensing rights, um, health boards already normally allow a period of grace for the dispensing practice to continue to dispense and have access to income to help with winding down uh, costs things like staff uh, stock recycling and some staff redundancy costs. Um, but um, in our view, I think it's important that the, the, the board and the practice are in discussion at an early opportunity to discuss that impact on that individual GP contractor's business and to jointly consider how to continue the delivery of GP services in the, in the area. And any transferring staff, would, would, would that be under TUPE conditions? Or, uh... um, I'm not a lawyer, so I wouldn't want to. <laughs> um, uh, um, uh, so, and I'm not sure that um, uh, Katie is, is particularly qualified. I think in, in, in some circumstances, yes, Tupi would, Tupi would apply, but I, I wouldn't be able to say that definitively for each situation. Yeah, I think so. yeah. It would seem reasonable they had the sort of same terms and conditions as they've been used to. Is there no further response? No. Um, as David said, it's not my area, um, but what I can say, uh, what I do know about Tupay is it tends to be very fact-specific, so it's not really possible to make a general statement about whether something would or wouldn't transfer without knowing specific information yeah. in yeah. relation to, to cases. Richard, you've got uh, supplementary. My understanding is there is no protection. And the other thing is that unlike other, any other business, the GP has not got the right, nor should they have the right, to sell the goodwill. Uh, so they are not able to actually receive recompense for their investment. Uh, I understand the bit about the premises, but you're still left with premises which you may be renting or you may have built or purchased. Uh, you're left with those premises which are now empty, or unless you can use them for other purposes or unless you can renegotiate your rental agreement, your recompense from the board to compensate you for the bit of space which is now no longer required. So I think there's a, a, frankly, there's a failure in these regulations to address the whole area of, uh, of the retraction of a service from, from, from the general practitioner. Um, that they may, for example, and I quoted the example of Drummond the other day, where the GP I know had invested, uh, you know, a not insignificant amount for a small practice, three and a half, four thousand pounds on software to improve patient safety. That now is of no value to her whatsoever. She can't sell it to anybody else. It has no value. Um, um, and the pharmacists are not, and when they take this dispensing over, they are not paying anything to us as taxpayers or the health service for the, for the effective goodwill they are acquiring. So I think, that we, you know, just commercially, we've actually, we, we have a situation where, you know, if the, if the, if the, if the, if the, um, if the new pharmacy is borderline in terms of its sustainability financially, and that is now looked at in the new regulations as one of the items, which I'm glad to see, but if, if, it, if it is actually in a town and it's sust very sustainable, they can acquire this without any purchase of goodwill from the health service. So I think, you know, I, I just feel we've, we've lost an opportunity here to say, in some cases, we want this pharmacy in. Yeah. It's in our interest to do that. We will charge nothing. On the other hand... For other areas, we should charge something. I, now, I, I appreciate. That was, a, that was a supplementary, Richard, so you need. You well, know, I, I appreciate there is. There oh, is we, need to, we need to. We need to. They pay for the allow, consultation. We need, to, we need to allow a response, and I've got. I've got okay. uh, uh, other questions from Kerry members. Yeah. Okay. The first thing is um, the pharmacy in uh, Millport. Uh, there were four members of staff working in the GP practice two of whom were reabsorbed into the practice and two were transferred over to the pharmacy. Now, that may not be a 2 agreement, 
but it was a way of trying to sort that. Goodwill doesn't exist for NHS services. Goodwill is about commercial services. And community pharmacies, as we discussed some weeks ago in um, Prescription for Excellence, the amount of business that's now coming through their front door is decreasing because of other competitors. So, and also pharmacies receive no help with their rental, uh, no help with um, the electronic uh, systems and staff. So we are not um, publicly giving them money for that. Um, so the goodwill would, and there is no goodwill, as you said, in general practice. Bob Doris. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I just check something, and I think it was just a turn of phrase that Dr Simpson used, because he's made a lot of good points. Um, he spoke about a failure in these regulations. Can I just clarify something? Do these regulations strengthen the position of dispensing GPs in remote and rural yes. areas? Yes. I can answer that. Um, the Cabinet Secretary has listened, and listened with concern, about what has been coming through the Parliament, what's been coming through communities and uh, people writing in. And he was most insistent that this became a priority for us to address how we strengthen these uh, dispensing doctor practices. And that is the purpose of the regulation. It's helpful. It's just, I think it's just to get clarity. So there's not a failure in these regulations. Dr Simpson and others might think there may be an opportunity to go further, whether just now or at a later date, even if these are reviewed at a later date. But this strengthens the position of dispensing uh, GPs. And I think that's getting lost a little bit in relation to some of the, the dynamics there. You used the word, Professor Scott, balance. C can I agree with that? Uh, and the word commercialism has been used quite a lot as well, because yes. GPs practices are commercial concerns, as are community pharmacies. And I agree with additional protection in certain circumstances, but you can also effectively providing a commercial monopoly to one business against another. Um, is that maybe one of the reasons why you went for three years? Because it's quite a big thing to say for all the right reasons to give a commercial monopoly to one commercial interest to exclude other commercial interests. Was that a concern when you went for, for three years? That is one of the concerns where you may get a new housing estate or some new use of land which could effectively alter that balance and uh, therefore uh, we have to keep looking at that. But the other thing I would say is we were very conscious, as we've said before, the National Health Service is a public service and regardless of any commercial activity, our requirement within the NHS is to provide an environment for cooperation. And so one of the aspects we looked in here is with the clinical pharmacist working with the GP surgery is to try and strengthen that uh, cooperation just as we are doing in the wider pharmacy and GP community. Just check on clinical pharmacists. You mentioned clinical pharmacists. In theory, would the anything to stop community pharmacists making that relationship with with uh, GPs practices in remote and rural areas either? Are they excluded from doing that? Um, we can use pharmacists who are employed in any aspect. Okay. But the one thing we must do is to ensure we're not providing some perverse incentive. So we have to ensure that that pharmacist in their activity is about the patient right. and not about uh, anything that their employer would want in terms of commercialism. Okay, so it's whoever's best place to provide it in, 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 in that area, yeah. perhaps. Now, uh, sustain financial sustainability is a, a key criteria. Now, I'm now not talking about... Um, uh, GPs per se um, my colleague Gil Patterson has got business experience, I don't but I suspect if you ask a remote or rural dispensing uh, dispensing GP um, is your dispensing pharmacy vital to your sustainability 
every single one will say yes, because if they don't have a monopoly on that, they will lose money. But losing money doesn't necessarily make a GP's practice not sustainable. It means they have less money. So how do you get the balance between commercial self-interest and what is sustainable? How is that teased out? I think I would uh, like to bring uh, Mr Thompson in at this stage. Um, I, th I think it's important to, to, to note that um, dispensing income for, for, for GPs is, is, is never intended to cross-subsidise um, uh, um, the, the, the core delivery of core services. That's in our statement of financial entitlement and uh, that's the directions which are the financial basis for this. We do know that that um, is not what plays out on the ground and I, uh, uh, and I think it's, a, you know, it's important that we do recognise that even if the rules state something uh, um, slightly different. Um, and I think in terms of balancing the, the, the uh, commercial interests of both parties, uh, that's why we've drawn the regulations in, in, in such a tight way um, with a very specific set of um, uh, criteria for controlled localities. So it is remote and rural. There is a GP dispensing doctor there. Um, but we do recognise there will be tensions, and um, as has played out previously and will play out under the new regulations, there, there, there will always be this argument as to... Um, as, as to who is uh, um, whose commercial interests are best served. Richard, do you want to come in? Yeah, could I just um, clarify something about the effect of a control locality? Whereas, like monopoly, have been used. Um, I just wanted to make sure that the understanding is correct. A controlled locality designation doesn't mean necessarily that a pharmacist application won't be granted. What it does do is the existing test of necessity or desirability will still apply. And then in addition to that, the PPC, the NHS board, will look at whether granting that application could prejudice existing provision of primary medical and pharmaceutical services in the controlled locality. If they decide that that application won't create any prejudice, then they can grant the application. So a controlled locality doesn't necessarily mean that a pharmacy application... So that's about striking the balance. I think that's very helpful. It's a much more nuanced explanation, which has helped me understand it. It was, was my lack of understanding, and that, that's helpful. Mr Thompson, it's quite helpful to be put on the record that there's no cross-subsidy there. So, for me, this is more about how, how we retain GPs in certain localities who might decide to relocate elsewhere. So, it's retention of a, a, a individuals who, who, who may, for whatever reason, decide to relocate elsewhere, but it's not about making... Um, the, the delivery of primary health care affordable, the dispensing part of the business because there is no cross subsidies. So I find that quite helpful as well. I think the final question I want to ask Convener is in relation to this controlled area uh, because one of the things that sometimes a community pharmacy might bring to an area and I'm a city MSP I have to say so I, I don't know the nuances of the dynamics in remote and rural areas is Sometimes you don't just get a pharmacist, you might actually get someone selling a loaf of bread and a pint of milk. In other words, they could be other social concerns in 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 that outlet. So there could actually be a a, a regenerative dynamic to uh, a, a, a dispensing pharmacist within a community out with the, a GP's dispensing area. Is that something that would be considered as part of the overall package? Should a should, should a, a community pharmacist seek to go in the pharmaceutical list in an area of these concerns that are, are, are these issues that would be looked at in the round? I think the main concern for the NHS would be the uh, national health services that would be provided. Let's try to understand the bigger picture. No further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Richard Lyle, do you want back in? Yes, uh, can you, thanks. Um, can, I, can I welcome the comments made by uh, Professor uh, Bill Scott in regards to safeguarding and the strengthens the situation, but uh, like others, I've received a couple of emails, and I, I want to refer to one. I'll not name the person who, actually, a doctor who sent it to me, but I'll and basically it's suggesting that the proposed legislation says nothing about how commercial pharmacies will be sanctioned if the promises they into, enter into with the health board are not fulfilled. How would these people be sanctioned if they don't fulfil the promises they make? Yes. Um, at present, we do actually have systems within the NHS where if a contractor does not provide the service that's required, they can be taken to a disciplinary committee. 
And further to that, if a patient or the board itself is not satisfied, they can refer that uh, pharmacist to the General Pharmaceutical yeah. Council, the regulator, and that could have severe consequences. So it doesn't need to necessarily be in this legislation. Yes. Is there are other acts or laws or, or other procedures that can be invoked against pharmacies who don't fulfil their duties? Yeah. That's fine. Thank you, Kandina. Uh, Gil Patterson. It's, uh, in regards to some of the questions that's been raised in regards to TUPI, and so we need to ask a couple of questions. I'll try and round them all together and get a, a feedback on it. I, I take it that uh, someone that's employed uh, for a dispensing G a GP is employed solely by that individual and that the health service have no participation in, in that whatever. Uh, would, that, would that be right? That, that is correct. Um, unless it's a member of staff who are actually being employed by the board to work within that practice. Right. But, uh, that doesn't apply in this case. So, these, these, so there's no input by the, the health service in the number of people that are employed in that location or who they are or what they are. Uh, would that be right? I think, um, and David can back me up, that these are commercial businesses right. and it's for them to determine uh, who they're employing and how those staff are used, yeah. not the NHS. So in other words, that uh, they're, they're not, they're not uh, working in the public sector, they're actually working in the private sector. So therefore, if, if, if that be the case, then they would be covered by employment law, just like the business that I own. I'm uh, covered by a, a, by a, a employment law that I need to adhere to, which would mean that the employer, me or the doctor, would be the person that's responsible for any redundancy in, a, in, in any circumstance that, the, the, that that business closes down for whatever reason. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't yeah. feel qualified to answer that question. No, it would be extremely worthwhile. Yeah, yeah. No, it, 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 it may be. I mean, I think it has been an issue. It, it has been raised, but it is, we are into a, a, you know, employment law now, and uh, there would need to be an arrangement. And indeed, I think the message that we're getting here, that the National Health Service would, 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 would not be expected to incur any additional cost as a result of any change in delivery of the service. And of course, if TUPI applied, then the National Health Service would need to take on the liability of those tens of years of employment. And then, as a consequence, in any future redundancy, they would become liable for a, you know, so, uh, you know, it's, a, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty complex and, and would, uh, you know, whether it, it could apply, I suppose it, it could apply if it, if it was being presented as some sort of takeover, but I think we've had the message that the, 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 the National Health Service here in Scotland is not going to incur any additional costs as a result of these arrangements on the ground. Is that the position? Or should Tra they? The transfer of any staff from one private sector to the other would be for the private sector, and we regard community pharmacy in that respect as a private employer. Okay. Is there any additional questions, Gil? I think we've got one more for Richard Simpson. Aileen, did you want to? No? No? Okay. Yes, it's, um, it's about the consultation process. The new uh, consultation process now... Whereas previously it was the applicant who was required to consult the community, it's now a consultation process which has to be agreed between the board and the applicant. And there have been concerns expressed to me about the uh, fact that it's, a, it's, it's, there is not um, appear to be a role either for the GP practice itself, which is obviously going to be affected, nor for the community. One of the problems we've had is GPs have, have uh, encouraged their communities to... Uh, I need I go on? Um, and the witnesses will know exactly what I'm talking about, and, and, and that's fair enough. But I think I'm just concerned that we, again, it's not a failure, as Bob Doris has suggested I was saying. I very much welcome these regulations, but I do think, again, you know, they, they haven't really addressed the issue 
of how the community can be involved in, in ascertaining that the process that is proposed in consultation is one that they subscribe to. Because I can see, foresee a situation in which the board and the applicant agree, consultation goes out, the community, whether or not encouraged by anybody else, actually say, I'm sorry, we don't think this process is reasonable or fair. We don't think it's correct. So who is going to, uh, how are you going to get the community involved in agreeing? Should, should the board be required in any guidance to consult the community council, who are the named person, who put up the named person eventually? Um, if you could just explain that a little bit further to me, um, and I have, I'm sorry, that's not my yeah. last question. Can All right. As we know, health boards have a general duty to ensure that any consultations which they undertake are consistent with the Scottish Health Council guidelines. And um, as we produce our guidelines, we shall be looking to address some of those concerns. Um, and I do take uh, the point that we have to um, make sure that we differentiate propaganda from fact. Right. Um, my last question that really arises from the comment by uh, Katie Richards, that the, the um, I've forgotten the word now, protected practice or the designated localities or whatever it is, uh, that that actually doesn't give any protection because there can still be an application made in, for any area in Scotland. And that is a slight concern because although there's a three-year now designated locality, any application could be made and there is then an assessment as to what effect it might have on the practice. Um, but there is, as far as I can see in the regulations, and I may be wrong, they are quite detailed. There is no requirement on the board to have any discussions or investigation of the practice to determine what the potential effect might be before the process actually starts. So does, uh, can Katie Richards explain to me, if you're a designated locality, an application comes in, is there a requirement now on the board to go and talk to the practice and say, right, well, we've received this application, you're a, protected locality, uh, you know, what effect will this have on you uh, if, um, if, if we proceed with this application? And I make this comment, convener, and this question, because my other concern is, that the, is, the, is the basic fallacy that is not being addressed here either, which David Thompson has alluded to, and that is that we know very well that there is cross-subsidy, and he has said that now on the record. So although the intention is that there shouldn't be, that business of general practice has a, has a wholeness to it, has a holistic view, which includes its dispensing with its costs and its, any, any money that they, they, they get into the practice from it. So I, I really have a serious concern that we haven't got this right. I hope we have. Mr. Doris, I hope we have. But I still have this concern. So I wonder if that, I think, could be addressed. Because there hasn't been a review of the effect of our previous regulations yes, on practices, had, which I've asked for. We've, we've had a very good question and answer session here, Richard, and I, I want the witnesses to respond, I think, in the back of that. Gil, it's you okay, want yeah. to ask... I'll, I'll, I'll forbid right. that second question. So could we, could we have a response uh, from uh, Katie Richards and others with the, the questions directly put? Um, yes, well, as I said before, I think... Um, the idea of the controlled locality is to increase the protection that's given to a dispensing GP. It introduces a further layer of scrutiny that boards can look at in relation to existing primary medical services, which didn't apply under the old regulations, so that's a new thing. In terms of how a PPC might assess the effect on a practice, um, I think it's about going back to this new um, joint consultation process. If you look at um, Regulation 5A, which introduces this um, new concept, there's um, specific <coughs> questions that the community is asked to provide views on, one of which is the potential for pharmaceutical services provided by the applicant to impact on existing NHS services. So it would be for a dispensing GP to write in any members of the community who had relevant views there. And after the consultation has finished, um, a consultation analysis report will be created which will summarise the responses and the PPC then have to look at that when they're determining an application. So that would be my response to that. 
Mr. Thompson, Mr. Thompson, I see you. Um, uh, just in terms of the, the dispensing income and the, and the, and the potential, um, obviously we, we recognise that dispensing income might have become part of the business planning model for, um, for a number of practices. And when a practice is having to withdraw or reduce a patient service as a result of the loss of dispensing income and the continuation of that service is considered to be necessary for the community, um, we expect that the Health Board and the practice are in discussion to put a properly funded contractual arrangement for that. So that's, that's, the, that's the thing at the back of that as well. So but we do recognise the situation, as you're saying. Can I uh, thank the witnesses for their attendance this morning and um, uh, a longer than expected session and uh, ex you know, ex extended questions and answers. Uh, can I thank you all for your attendance this morning. Thank you very much indeed. We now move to agenda item number five, which is petition PE1492, um, which was referred to uh, last week by uh, referred to referred to us by, uh, last week by the public petitions committee. And of course, this relates uh, to the evidence we have just taken and to the SSI that we will consider formally later uh, in the meeting. Uh, there is a paper, as committee members will be aware of, which suggests that uh, ultimately we can close the petition or indeed uh, allow it to remain open and returning to the issue later in the parliamentary session. Um, and I invite uh, 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 comments from committee members as to their view of, 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 of the paper before us. Bob. Uh, thanks, convener. I was, yeah, a lot of the issues or the themes raised within this, we've just had a question and answer session, which, which very uh, much relates, relates to it. But I suspect there's also another piece of work that this committee is, is doing, and obviously we discuss our work plan in private uh, in normal circumstances, but uh, I would expect we will be looking at prescription for excellence again going forward in the future, which is very much about the new relationship and dynamic between uh, dispensing GPs, clinical pharmacists, community pharmacists, and how, how we can better meet the needs of, of patients and constituents who are, who are not getting the pharmaceutical care that we'd like them to get. Currently, I was wondering, convener, that said, if rather than close the petition or do a specific piece of work on this, if when the next time we do scrutinise prescription for excellence, we might think about how we can incorporate some of these themes Within our evidence sessions, so that would be my that would be my suggestion. Is there an alternative view? No. Can we say that, that we 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 will then um, allow th the petition to remain open, and <coughs> it will be a focus on uh, future discussions on prescription for excellence? Is everyone? Agreed. Thank you. We then move to agenda item number six, uh, which is um, subordinate legislation, and we have two negative instruments today. The first instrument is the National Health Service Pharmaceutical Services Scotland Miscellaneous Amendments Regulations 2014, SSI 2014-148. There has been no motion to annul and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on the instrument. Are there any comments from the members? There are no comments? Nope. Um, is the committee agreed, therefore, to make no recommendations? Agreed. Thank you. The second instrument is the National Health Service Superannuation Scheme Scotland Miscellaneous Amendments Regulations 2014, SSI 2014-154. There, again, there has been no motion to annul. Uh, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has drawn the instrument to the attention of the Parliament, the, and the details are outlined in your papers. Um, has the committee uh, agreed to make no recommendation? Well agreed. Thank you for that. Um, and can I suggest that we should spend briefly uh, at this point uh, where we set up for the Minister on our uh, agenda item number seven. Thank you.
We now move uh, to the seventh item on the agenda today, uh, to, uh, which is subordinate legislation, and we have one affirmative instrument before, before us, which is the National Confidential Forum Prescribed Care and Health Services Scotland Order 2014 draft. Um, as usual with affirmative instruments, we will have an evidence taking session with the Minister and his officials on the instrument. Once we have had all of our questions answered, we will then have the formal debate on the motion. And can I welcome uh, the Minister for Public Health and his officials, Michael Matheson, uh, Ailsa Garland, um, Principal Legal Officer, Food, Health and Community Care, and Sue Moody, Survivor Scotland Team Care Support and Rights Division Scottish Government. Welcome to you all. And can I give the Minister an, uh, an opportunity to make uh, an opening statement? Uh, thank you, convener, for a chance to say a few words about this uh, order. Uh, this order sets out what a care or health service means for the purposes of eligibility to take part in the National Confidential Forum. You may recall uh, that at stage two of the bill, uh, I made a commitment to the committee that we would aim to offer the opportunity to take part in the forum to as many people as possible who were in institutional care as children in Scotland. Uh, this uh, meets that commitment and we have sought to prescribe as broad a range of care and health services as possible. We have also tried to reflect the uh, different types of care and health services that have existed over the last 80 years. Uh, we want to make sure that everyone alive today who was in institutional care as a child at any time can take part in the forum. The order makes no distinction between private and public providers of institutional care nor does it distinguish between arrangements made by the state and private arrangements made by families. This is again designed to enable as many people as possible who are in institutional care as children to participate, regardless of their circumstances. The order potentially includes services that were not designed exclusively or mainly for children. We know that children in the past have been placed in adult facilities, including prisons, and poor law institutions. The order prescribes in Article 2 health services provided in a hospital, an independent clinic or a sanatorium. It also prescribes a range of care services in Article 3, which members can find on page 2 of the order. The prescribed services in the order need to be read alongside the conditions set out in the 2003 Act relating to eligibility to participate in the forum. So, for example, one of the conditions is that the care or health service included residential accommodation for children. I would reiterate that the intention is to include a wide range of services uh, to make the forum as accessible as possible, and I am more than happy to answer any points the committee wish to raise. Thank you, Minister. We are now open for questions from the committee. Do we have any questions for the Minister? Rhoda Grant. Just on the comment the Minister made about residential care, what happens to those who weren't in residential care? Do they still have rights to access? Well, you may recall that at uh, stage one and stage two, we had a discussion around issues relating to, for example, um, uh, kinship care, etc. And um, we had some work undertaken by Celsus to consider this issue, and it was a very low response to their consultation on whether settings out with an institutional setting should be included in the National Confidential Forum. Uh, and given the uh, findings, it was decided it wouldn't be appropriate for the National Confidential Forum to include what would be considered to be residential settings. Uh, so that's why the National Confidential Forum is focused on institutional settings. Now, of course, there are uh, <coughs> there is scope for anybody who's in a residential setting to, uh, in a non-residential setting to raise concerns with the appropriate authorities. But the uh, National Confidential Forum was focused on uh, residential settings right from the very outset, and so the time to be heard pilot was established as well. Okay, I'm just thinking of schools and the like. Well, as long as it's got a residential element to it, yes, it's included in the care uh, definition that's been set in the order. OK, but not an ordinary school? No, an ordinary uh, or If it doesn't have a residential setting, no. Any other questions? Bob Doris. Just, just uh, 
very briefly, Minister. I was just having a look at the, the consultation, and I see with 450 stakeholders, it was quite a substantial consultation exercise undertaken. But the notes we have says, in terms of the number of replies, but 12 substantive replies is is the note that I got. I'm just wondering if um, there was a, any particular reason why it was such a a low. Um, so substantive replies, yes, but quite a low number of replies that, that came into the consultation. Are you referring to the, the Celsius uh, consultation work? Yeah, I've got an, under, under the policy note that it says 450 stakeholders, including survivors, supporter organisations, child health commissioners, service providers and purchasers, academics, and I could go on at least several. And it says there were 12 respondents to that. It doesn't. My note doesn't specifically tell me that it was Celsius. It, it may very well be, but that's what's in the policy note. Minister. It may be in terms of the, the actual orders themselves. Yeah. In general, I think it's a reflection of uh, a general support for what's been set out in the actual orders. The uh, Celsius consultation, which may be a separate part, I'm not sure if it's the same figures, but also had a very low return. Uh, and actually, uh, a significant portion of those who returned the response to that weren't in support of kinship care, etc., being included, or foster care being included in the National Confidential Forum. That's helpful. Thank you very much. There are no other questions. We now then move to agenda item number eight, uh, which is the formal debate on the affirmative SSI, uh, in which we have just taken, uh, taken evidence. And I refer to my earlier... Um, Warning that we are now the difference between questions and debate, and we've done that in a previous item, so I don't feel there's any need to do that again. Uh, can I now invite the Minister to move motion S, um, S4M10414, please? Moved. Thank you. Uh, as we are now in the debate, do, do any of the members wish to contribute to the debate? No? Um, I don't. I think the Minister will feel the need then to sum up. OK. Uh, can I now then put the question on the motion? The question is that Health and Sport Committee recommends that the National Confidential Forum Prescribe Care and Health Services Scotland Order 2014 draft be approved. Are we all approved? Agreed. Thank you. Um, can I thank the, the Minister and his officials um, for their attention, uh, attendance at this session? And we're just going to take a moment till we uh, 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 turn round. Uh, and of course, the Minister staying for our agenda item number nine Food Scotland Bill. So we'll just take a moment, suspend for a moment. Um, 
Okay. We now move to agenda item nine and our final evidence session on the Food Scotland Bill. Uh, we welcome um, again the Minister for Public Health, um, Michael Matheson, Matheson, and his officials, Morris Fraser, Bill Team Leader, and Lindsay Anderson, Solicitor Scottish Government. Welcome to you all. Um, we, there isn't, you, you're not going to make a statement going right to questions? Yeah, that's fine. To go straight to questions if you wish to. Right, good. We go. Who's got the first? No questions, Minister. We begin. <laughs> Nanette Millen. Ah, we were nearly out there. Uh, thanks, Demina. It's just, uh, just looking at this a quote from the, the financial memorandum. The bill, which is the, the grant, financial grant provided to FSS will exceed that currently provided to the FSA in Scotland by five, approximately five million to compensate for the extra roles that the FSS will now have, I presume taking on board the activities that have been taken out of the FSE south of the border. Am I right in thinking that? Uh, anyway, the, it says the, the intention is to have the increase offset through a financial transfer from SF, FSA UK wide budget to the Scottish Government to represent the activities which will now be delivered in Scotland rather than a UK basis. Yeah, I think I've got that right myself now. Um, and the level of the financial transfer is the subject of ongoing negotiations. I just wondered if you have any information as to how those negotiations are getting on. I mean, anecdotally, I've been told they're proving a little bit difficult, but I, I don't know if, if there's a time set from that or, or what the current situation is. There's obviously funding given by the Scottish Government directly to the FSA in Scotland, but there's also funding that goes from that that goes into the UK central pot for providing functions um, uh, 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 to Scottish ministers. Um, and some of the negotiations which are taking place just now uh, are around uh, some of that money being repatriated um, uh, and uh, drawn back. Uh, negotiations that are at a very advanced stage. I'm uh, I'm confident we'll get to a point of agreement on uh, uh, and the final outcome from that. But it's, it's essentially monies which um, have gone from the Scottish Government into funding aspects of the FSA at a UK level uh, to provide certain functions to us uh, that we're in negotiations with. And they've got uh, three office bases over which that's covered. So I'm confident we'll get to a point of agreement on that. Um, I mean, I, see, I heard anecdotally that these haven't been very straightforward negotiations. I don't know if there's any comment you can make on that or not. Um, uh, I think they've been straightforward in terms of just within machinery of government. I don't think there's been any particular difficulties with them other than, uh, as you'd always expect, negotiations, um, uh, uh, different positions being taken. But um, um, I'm confident we'll get to a point of agreement uh, that we are satisfied uh, uh, reflects what we think uh, is an appropriate amount that should be returned to the Scottish Budget for it. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Whatever the financial arrangement, I think we heard in evidence, and you've probably seen that, that, that um, the other important factor is not to disturb too much the networks and the exchange information, the whole uh, issue of um, research as well, which was were, were, were things that were highlighted in our, uh, our evidence. So how... How is that progressing to ensure that we don't cause too much disruption and then we can still use all of these important networks that that evidence says we, we should be maintained? Yeah, we're, we're making good progress with that. We've had a, you know, from the very outset, we've had a very good working relationship with the FSA at a UK level uh, since the decision was made to establish the FSS and to... Uh, and to maintain a good partnership uh, with them. And um, uh, there are aspects that they're keen to maintain with us because there's areas of research and expertise in Scotland that they want to continue to be able to make use of and, and we're keen to work with them. It also opens up some opportunities for us as well at a European level, which um, it would normally be filtered through the London office, which, um, which the FSS will be able to tap into directly themselves. Um, so there's potentially some new opportunities uh, for us going forward around areas such as uh, research. But also the, uh, what we're also doing is uh, uh, developing a memorandum of understanding with the FSA um, uh, around um, uh, accessing uh, and uh, sharing expertise and information between the different agencies. Mm. So um, in general, there's actually been a very, a very cordial and a very, um, a very good relationship right from the very outset in looking to maintain 
and to uh, and to support access to relevant bodies of expertise that we have here in Scotland and that they also have uh, within the FSA and the rest of the UK. In terms of the opportunities, will we, will we be competing with the UK uh, agency for European research funding, or does that happen now? Um, there will be, well, most of the, it would be taken forward on a corporate basis by the FSA uh, at a UK level. There is obviously um, uh, areas of expertise in Scotland, so for example, around um, shell fisheries, um, Scotland is, from a world perspective, seen as a, a leading authority in that area, and quite a bit of that research uh, was then passed to the Scottish office to conduct on their behalf. The, um, uh, but there will also be an opportunity for the FSS, from an operational point of view, to consider where they wish to carry out other areas of specific research and for them to then consider how they wish to fund that, whether they use that within their own resources, whether they look at tapping into other international resources, particularly at an EU level which are available to them, that opportunity will be there um, in a way which uh, isn't there for the same for the FSA office in Aberdeen at the present time because of the corporate nature and the way in which the FSA operate across the UK. Mm -hmm. now, I'm, just, I'm just wondering whether that would disturb the relationships if you're actually, you know, competing for European funds with the, you, you know, the UK body, you know... I, 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 I don't think it'd be a case of competing. It's about utilising expertise. Um, so uh, areas where the UK agency uh, feel they've got an expertise and, uh, you know, money's allocated on the basis of where expertise is in these matters and the quality of the research. Um, uh, so I wouldn't see it as being competition, but it will allow, uh, for example, um, uh, uh, the FSS to look at areas where it wants to build up its expertise and to, as it sees fit, to, to, to apply for any funding uh, that, it, that it thinks might be appropriate for that, but it's based upon expertise and the quality of the of the quality of the research that will be undertaken. It's more about the the issues that you know that we hear constantly that, that that joint submissions and and you know there's you know there's no single point of particular expertise about about how to pursue funding, how what issues would be um, suitable for. Research and uh, you know the the main thrust of all of that was keeping that network pretty tight. You know more about joint submissions rather than you know I don't think we had any evidence that that, that the opportunity from any of the people we had that there would be an opportunity to to go away on our own researching. You know, we, we didn't seem to have that evidence, when us, so that would be, you know, that's why it's, it's a first Well, there'd be absolutely no reason why the FSS and the FSA couldn't make a joint submission right, for that, the purpose yeah. of actually pursuing research. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh -huh. uh, absolutely none whatsoever. Uh -huh. It's the first time we've heard about the, the opportunities that, and evidence that, that may be there for research institutions to be working on their own. That, that, it wasn't in any of the written submissions, or indeed it was the opposite of that. I can't, I can't comment in terms of uh, the view that, you know, there'd, there'd be no reason why, for example, a university in Scotland in a particular field who wants to do a piece of research with the FSS wouldn't be in a position not to look at taking that forward with they them. They can do that now? Uh, they can do it, but it's, it's more limited in terms of the type of work that they can actually do because of the corporate nature of the FSA and how it carries its research out. Mm. Um, Richard Lyle? Oh, Rosa. I, Sorry, I've got Rosa on the list first and then okay. Richard. Okay. Um, just as a supplementary question on the finances, um, we had evidence that, <coughs> as things stand, um, the financial memorandum is okay, but there is scope in the bill to increase the duties on the food on food standards Scotland, um, and there was talk about nutrition and diet and, and, and the like. Will further uh, resources become available if the scope of the agency is increased? So we've designed the bill on the basis that if um, uh, if there was a, a, a view at some point we should provide additional responsibilities to the FSS, that we've got the legislative framework which allows that to happen. So we're creating the footprint. However, uh, there would have to be a reason for doing it, 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 committing any additional responsibilities to the FSS going forward, including uh, looking at um, uh, uh, the evidence base for doing that, the justification for doing that, and also what the cost implications for that would be as well. So uh, there would be a due process that would be gone through, including look at any cost implications. 
uh, before any additional duties were undertaken by the uh, by the FS FSS going uh, forward. So, um, uh, uh, because we aren't providing, uh, uh, because we aren't extending the role uh, significantly, there was no need for any additional resource at the present time. Uh, but if that changed in the future, we would have to look at the financial implications that could have for the FSS. Um, can I turn to the board? Um, we took evidence on the makeup of the board. Um, it seemed to be a, a general consensus around the fact that three would be far too small. And I'm wondering if you've had thoughts about the size of the board, the makeup of the board, whether um, industry representatives should be on the board, or as many people have said to us that you know people should be independent of industry on the board and also of trade union recognition as, as space for trade union reps on the board. Have you had any thoughts about that? Well, um, in terms of the board numbers, it's a minimum of four, um, a maximum of eight. Um, that broadly reflects uh, what we have for other organisations of that size, so which are uh, non-ministerial-led uh, uh, organisations. Oscar, for example, um, the housing regulator all have uh, a minimum of four, maximum of eight. We obviously have some of our bigger boards, like SEPA bigger organisations, have a higher number, they go up to ten. Is it a ten, a minimum of five? Yes, five. A, a minimum of five, uh, but they're much bigger organisations in Scottish Enterprise. So we have, I think the board numbers are broadly reflective of um, uh, an organisation of its size. Uh, um, uh, I think four would be, if it dropped down to four, it would be too low, but we would want to maintain it up at a higher level, uh, closer to the eight as possible, and that's about just managing ongoing uh, board, uh, uh, board numbers. Um, in relation to uh, the makeup of the board itself, you know this is a uh, this is a um, uh, you know a, a consumer protection organisation, and it's important that the representatives on the board um, have uh, a, a clear commitment to that responsibility, uh, and uh, and taking forward the FSS's objectives in seeking to achieve that outcome as well, uh, and the board membership should be one which reflects that. Uh, but members, rather than going for a, a, a sectorial approach to it, something from that sector and that sector, it should be based upon their ability to contribute to achieving that objective uh, and their expert, expertise uh, uh, and knowledge that can assist in the FSS achieving uh, uh, its outcomes. And on the, the final point about the issue of uh, trade union uh, membership, the process for public appointments to... Uh, a board of this nature as to the uh, uh, the public appointments process and ethical uh, uh, the commission for ethical standards and public uh, life, which will apply to this in any other way. But I would expect the FSS to have good industrial relations in the same way the FSA have, and to have a, a structure in place that allows the uh, those uh, union representatives to be able to engage fully uh, within the uh, the processes that they have as an organisation. But would not would it not be the case that if there was a ring fence trade union place on the board that that would enhance trade union um, relations Sorry. as part of the board, um, and is that not commonplace in other other boards? No, it's not commonplace in other boards. Um, uh, it, but it's a you know the board has been constructed in the same way it is for any other uh, public body. Um, uh, so, for example, we have. Um, uh, within our health boards, we have employee directors who are trade union representatives that have a responsibility for engaging in the process. But um, you know, with the board structure, the uh, the processes that the the board and the chief executive look to put in place, I would expect to reflect maintaining and supporting good industrial relations, and to make sure trade unions have a a strong voice and a role to play in helping to uh, shape and manage the organisation going uh, forward. And, um, uh, once the board's in place, they can then look at how to best achieve that. OK, but do you want to legislate to make sure that happens? It's not contained within the bill. We've constructed it in the same way as we have for other public appointment boards, and it'll be done on the basis of um, an open public appointment process. You have a supplementary on that, and Just to clarify something that the, the Minister said, because I mean, the, the bill says no fewer than three nor more than seven. You mentioned the f figure four. Will that be written into the legislation? That, 
Do you want to just clarify? I think that uh, yes, yes. So um, the the food standards. So um, it's four. Yes, it's four. So it's a person appointed as the chair. Yeah. So I think that's what the minister is referring to. Yeah. Yes, three yeah. three plus one and seven plus one. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, Rhoda Grant has asked the question I was, I was going to ask, but can I just explore, and I take the point about trade unions, but basically within the FSS, you would, uh, if we were really want to uh, add people from that division, you talk about environmental health officers or someone from the society in order to be on the board. Um, but So I take it we'll advertise, after the bill is, is, is passed, we'll advertise... Um, do interviews and who will select the people on the board? Will it be um, officers or uh, cabinet secretary or even yourself, Minister? The process will be is that it will be the same process that's set down by the Commission for Ethical Standards and Public Life, and that is that they will conduct a process uh, which is a, an open and transparent process that goes out to public advertisement. It, it uh, would involve uh, an interview panel and then it would uh, involve making recommendations to ministers um, on uh, who should be appointed to the board. So, as it is for the present, uh, board of the FSA. Uh, so, the FSA's uh, appointment has come to... It's actually a shared uh, responsibility. All four uh, ministers who are responsible for the FSA in the UK have to agree to appointments uh, to the board and... Uh, um, uh, and for the FSS, it will be the same process. So it will be an open, transparent, uh, fully comply with the uh, Commission for Ethical Standards and Public Life uh, and appointments will be made uh, on, uh, on the recommendation from the interview panel. Uh, through you, Convener, I, I certainly don't doubt that, but the, again, the, the interesting part over the last uh, couple of evidence sessions is the interest on who would be on the board. Uh, you know, uh, at the end of the day, uh, there are various firms who don't want to see someone from another firm on, on the board. But basically, um, we have you know well-respected uh, people who, in the past, have been consulted in regards to food. You know, Professor Pennington, etc. Um, basically, would it be people of high standard who are? Uh, there to ensure that uh, you know Scottish food and drink is is, is a, you know, the best in the world, and, and to ensure that, that that high standard is kept. So we would ensure that uh, whatever we draw from and whatever um, interviews are, are are made, and the best people that the best people are on this board. Is that the intention that you have? Well, it's certainly the intention. Um, uh, it, it's down to individuals to choose, obviously, to apply uh, uh, to be a member of the board. But uh, as I said at the outset, you know, this is a consumer protection organisation, um, and uh, the board members um, uh, should be reflective of that that type of approach, and that they should have a, a knowledge and expertise that can assist in uh, achieve, achieving the objectives of the the, the FSS, which again uh, have to be uh, you call, uh, submitted to Parliament. So. Um, you know, I uh, want the best people as possible on the board. Um, it will then be down to uh, who applies and for the interview panel to then make recommendations to ministers with the objective of uh, individuals who can uh, achieve the objective of what the FSS is, and that is a, a consumer protection organisation. Thank you. Thank you. Bob Doris. Yeah, um, thank you, Convener. Just a couple of of uh, brief questions. Um, I lay in a question which was uh, pursued with some quite constructive answers from industry. I think Tesco had a representative here was in relation to testing that, that particularly large supermarkets but a whole range of, of those in the sector uh, would do. Now following the horse meat scandal I think a, a number of large providers, Tesco included, are now voluntarily putting much more of their testing regime in the public domain for everyone to see. I'm just wondering how consistent that is across all um, such, 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 such players within industry and whether or not the government is minded to have some kind of voluntary code around that? Because I notice there's no statutory obligation within the bill to compel that at present. And where does the balance sit between working with, with industry and the sector to get, first of all, not just to see um, the results of tests, but just to work in partnership to provide support to make sure 
that there's an intelligence risk-based approach, informed risk-based approach to, to testing. So some more information on that would be good in terms of the voluntary basis, a potential voluntary code, or the need for any statutory moves in relation to that. It would be helpful if I give a wee bit of background to some of the stuff around the horse, horse at meets, uh, uh, the horse, uh, horse meat fraud uh, issues, because I was obviously involved in that, although it, was a, it wasn't a public health issue, it was a, a food labelling issue, so I was involved because of my responsibility to the FSA in Scotland. And uh, One of the challenges at that particular point was that um, um, uh, retailers were conducting testing, uh, but the testing wasn't routinely shared with the FSA. Uh, and uh, during the course of the horse meat scandal, it was put to the retail industry that it would be helpful if that testing was shared with the FSA in order to have a clearer understanding of what their own uh, findings were. Uh, and that was agreed on a voluntary basis. Um, and that information, uh, when it was appropriate, was then placed in the public domain um, uh, uh, at that particular uh, point. And now some of the retailers do have a system in place where they give some indication as to uh, the outcomes from some of the, the testing which they, uh, they conduct. In terms of the policy and going forward in that matter, whether there should be a, a, a mandatory scheme in that, that would be for the FSS to advise us. So if the FSS, from a policy perspective, uh, advise ministers that we should move this onto a statutory footing, then we would obviously then have to consult in that matter and then consider how we then take that forward as a government. So the FSS's role will be as is the FSA's role just now, is to advise ministers on what we should do in this area. Should it be a voluntary scheme? Should it be a mandatory scheme? Uh, and if so, what should it look like? Uh, and for us then to respond to that and to look at taking that forward through a, a consultation process. And I think you raised an important point, and it's about the relationship between the industry and the uh, and the, uh, uh, a food safety body like the FSA or the FSS, which is extremely important. And it's in, it, it, it's, it's, there's a balance to be struck by how, um, how effective they feel that placing that type of information can be useful in terms of driving forward consumer protection or whether there's a more appropriate way in which that can be achieved. But how that ultimately is taken forward is a matter for the FSS to advise us as a government. And if they recommend to us that that's, that's their job, is to advise and to inform us and to do that in an open way, if they're saying that this should be put in a statutory footing, then we would then consult and look at how that could be taken forward. OK, thank you. That, that, that's very helpful. Um, I've got another area of question. I don't know if any of my, my colleagues have... Um, OK, I mean, I mean just, yeah. just on the food inspection, we had yeah. some, um, you know, because we raised that yeah. with uh, some of our panels, um, uh, because we, we had an evidence session <laughs> from the, uh, a visit um, to Aberdeen Fish Processors, and they uh, explained to us that the level of inspection from the various supermarkets very high, whereas the local authority was maybe once a year, you know, but there was a lot of regulation going on there. Um, and so we were asking some questions about, you know, is there a lot, you know, a regulation inspection that already goes on? Of course, the counter view to that was that where is the independence here uh, and, and the importance of the ability, um, where that be co-located in Scotland or whatever, um, you know, rather than the responsibility of individual small councils, uh, but the importance of independent testing and inspection. Um, I, I don't know where you wish to comment on, uh, um, on any, of, uh, any of that, given that lots of local authorities, given the situation, are withdrawn from some of those services uh, of inspection and regulation. Well, I think it's a, you, you, you've raised a good issue and a good point because um, one of the, um, of course, the, the, the FSA as it stands at the present moment uh, as a competent authority does have a level of work that it does with local authorities and tries to provide and provides them with a, a level of guidance and structure around some aspects of testing that they should be uh, uh, considering. But there is independence at a local level and how they take that forward uh, in a practical basis. And moving forward with the FSS, um, uh, again, it would be an operational matter for them. I think there is a, an opportunity to explore how some of that that um, testing regime is taken forward, uh, whether there is scope to look at um, having some uh, a greater level of it uh, taken forward at a national level 
um, and uh, uh, and what aspects should also then be left to local responsibility. So I think there is a an opportunity to look at that relationship between the local mm -hmm. and the FSS uh, once it's established on uh, whether there should be an element of centralised testing that's undertaken rather than being left to uh, uh, local discretion. Uh, and uh, that'd be something that would obviously the FSS would have to discuss and explore with their counterparts and local authorities. But I think there is an issue in there uh, that merits uh, further consideration and that's something I would imagine that the new FSS would want to consider. It also raised some of the questions, I think it was previously with Bob and others in the discussion of some of the, fan, of the panel, the, the, the issue between uh, food hygiene and safety and quality and, uh, and the labelling regime, or indeed uh, when it's mislabeled, uh, the question of, uh, you know, I think we've got a strong message from R.C. Anderson, that, that, you know, one of, of one of our recent sessions, that we shouldn't be wasting good food we should really, you know, uh, you know, so about the consequences of finding something. It's mislabeled. It's pork, not beef. But there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and and what, you know, how we dispose of it. I, mean, I don't know whether the minister wants to um, speak to any of these issues that have been tested in our evidence sessions. Well, I, I think, you know, we, obviously the, uh, the food and drink industry is of tremendous value to uh, the Scottish economy and it's our interest to have a very, uh, uh, a very robust uh, and clear um, uh, regulatory regime in place for food safety and uh, for food uh, quality, given that uh, in general Scottish food is seen as being of a, um, uh, produce is seen as being of a high quality. Um, uh, there is a... Um, uh, you know, if you go back to the horse meat uh, uh, issue as well, uh, the reason it wasn't a public health issue is because it was a labelling. Um, it wasn't by consuming horse meat that you would do any harm to your health. It's that the label didn't say it; it contained horse meat, um, uh, so it was fraud on that basis. Uh, given it, it, the product contained something that wasn't in the label, and what we're doing with the bill as well, of course, is taking forward some of the recommendations that were made by uh, Professor Jim Scudamore and his team, who reviewed. Um, uh, uh, the horse meat incident to make recommendations around, for example, being able to uh, take forward robust action if there is an issue around mislabelling uh, to mm. ensure that there is um, uh, that there's appropriate action taken swiftly in these matters and some of the regulatory powers that enforcement officers will have will allow them to deal with those types of things more robustly. So I think there's a there's a there's a need to make sure that the public can have confidence in what. The label say on products that that's what it actually contains, uh, balanced against a, a reasonable testing regime um, as well, but also having the necessary enforcement powers in order to make sure that action can be taken quickly and robustly if it's necessary, if there's an issue around uh, mislabeling of products. We heard, um, I think, just recently last week about the European um, uh, regulations that are already in the system, the, the, yeah. the food um, information to consumers regulations. Yeah. They, you, you don't intend to go beyond any of those regulations, do you? Or I see Mr Fraser nodding. Or yeah, well, these go, uh, these go a bit further uh, than what's contained there. There's also a time frame around the, the European regulations in terms of their enforcement point, which is not clear yet. So there's uh, uh, an issue around that. But we are taking it a, a bit further in terms of responsibility that if you... Um, uh, if uh, you might not be selling the product, but if you believe um, that there may be an element of mislabeling, then you have a responsibility uh, to report as well. So, and that comes off the back of the, the horse meat scandal, so which was recommended as being a, a way of helping to drive forward improvement and clearer responsibility uh, in reporting in areas where you suspect that there may be a mislabeling. So if you are a distributor... Uh, you may not be a producer, but if you're a distributor and you believe that there is an issue around uh, mislabeling, then you have a legal responsibility. If it's too that. too good to be true, then you've got a responsibility to. You've got pass exactly. That so or, you've got. So you've that would go beyond the regulations. So that goes. That goes a bit wider than what's actually set out in the European. Is there any other elements of that? That or is it just that element? That's principally just that element. And the issue we have around there's still a, a lack of clarity around the time frame. I don't know if we've. Well, it's just, it's just, 
it's, it's the time frame is likely to be roughly the same as ours. Right. The, the, okay. the, so the, the, there's not very much difference. I think the committee may have had evidence that there might uh, be a perception of duplication across the two, but there very clearly isn't. That yeah. the, the, the duplication is, is is not there. That our uh, bill brings for the the duty to report to the central authorities that you think something's gone. That's an intelligence gathering tool to try and clamp down. Whereas what the food information regulations are doing is, if you know something, then you ought to tell your supplier and to whom you're supplying. It, not the authorities. So no it, was, it was an issue. It was raised, you know, with their manufacturer experience because they, they are producing pallets of prepared food and fish going to Norwich and you know all, all over the UK. And they were they were anxious that uh, any changes in label requirements uh, that wouldn't harm their their their, their, their business. But uh, you know they're. You've given the assurance of there will be no requirement to. The one other thing to perhaps give assurance on is that um, the, the authorised officers have uh, powers not only to detain and seize um, and offer the courts opportunity to destroy, but um, simple relabeling, recon recomposition. These are all these can all be done. So the food need not be wasted just because a label is found to be wrong. And the, the, the authorised authorities have the power to ask people to take certain action, and that may just be to relabel so the food wouldn't be wasted. I, I think most of the questions I was going to explore, the, our convener has, has, has absolutely uh, nailed the things that had to be asked. But just for a little bit of a clarity in relation to food fraud, uh, where, where it's a deliberate labelling fraud, um, would, would, would the option be there not just to seize the food? And I said wrongly destroy. I, can, I was comparing it to like hooky goods, if you like, that might, might or may, may not get destroyed. Um, could the order be to pass on to food banks or to charities or to whatever? Because I, I, I don't want to sound too heavy-handed in some elements of industry, which I'm sure are a minority, but if it's a blatant food fraud, I mean, blatant because you're getting something at 50p <laughs> uh, for 500 grams or whatever, rather than 4.99, um, then it's a it's blatant fraudulent activity. I don't mind if they they're not allowed to relabel that food. I'm quite content for that food to go somewhere else as long as it's commensurate with the scale of the fraud. Would that is that power there to redirect healthy but fraudulent food to elsewhere? I think there's the enforcement officers get broadly two options here. One is that they can obviously um, uh, take a, a fixed penalty there. They can actually enforce there, saying, "Look, you can't move that anywhere um, until we've done further investigations into this matter." Uh, and um, it may then be they come back and say, "You're going to have to relabel this product uh, to make it correct uh, because what's contained in the packet doesn't constitute what's in the label." Um, the other option is that it could be referred to the procurator of fiscal and it would go to the sheriff, a uh, sheriff court, uh, who then determine what should happen to the food. So um, uh, it, Rana has been able to say that the food should go to a food bank or something like that. If the sheriff was to determine that, um, depending on the nature of it, that would be a matter for the courts. But it's, um, mm. it will depend on what the nature of the food fraud is and the type of product that you're dealing with as well. Um, uh, because particularly around um, uh, perishable goods, uh, it's yeah. a, it, there's a very limited time yeah. frame. And as you know, with food yeah. banks, they, they don't really use perishable goods um, uh, for, for, to, to a great extent for obvious reasons. I, I actually think that that's exactly where I was going to go. Can we, one of the questions I asked one of the first evidence sessions was, if you read, and I apologise for concentrating in retailers, but that, if you like, that's the public face. You don't always see the food chain behind it all. Um, if it's a small independent retailer, one one shop, maybe two shops, and whether they've done it's deliberate fraud or otherwise, let's say it's, let's say it's deliberate fraud, and there's a fine scale on that. And let, let's pick Tesco because I've actually complimented Tesco for what they're now doing. So I just pick them randomly. There's Tesco metros right across Scotland. So one similar infringement in one Tesco metro right across Scotland. Sorry for singling them out. Um, the footprint of Tesco across the whole of Scotland is far more substantial than that small independent retailer. Can the fine scale be flexible enough, or in the future, could it be flexible enough to recognise the extent of the tradable business across Scotland for an infringement by a corporation? An important part will be is depending on who's committed the fraud. Um, uh, so, if um, uh, you know, if, if if a product is found in a shop, independent or part of a retail chain, there has to be an investigation into. 
who committed the fraud and where that responsibility sure. may lie, and obviously then uh, appropriate measures would be uh, would be taken. And I know that the Lord Advocate has also, I think, indicated to the committee that he's prepared to make his information and advice available to, um, I think, prior to stage two, around um, uh, uh, about the advice that they'll be giving around the type of fine structure that should be put in place as well, which would be reflective of what the courts would do. So an important part would be it depends on scale, who's responsible and the nature of it, which is going to then be reflected on any fine or any criminal uh, action that's taken or any action about criminal activity that's taken against them. Okay, I don't feel so bad for picking out that large retailer because I complimented him earlier on about, about what they're now doing. In, in relation to food fraud, uh, a retailer's representative um, last week, whose name escapes my apologies, but the, 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 the gentleman was talking about on labelling and food fraud was almost not deliberately not painting a picture of small independent producers presenting at farmers markets and labels and things not being labelled correctly in terms of labelling infringements. My understanding is the bill was not about a, a yes minister bureaucracy around the finer points of labelling. It was more about overt, deliberate attempts to defraud the consumer. So can you give some reassurances in relation to when we talk about labelling and when we talk about food fraud, we're not trying to capture someone who may have five ingredients on a label when there's actually six and the sixth one's not mentioned by omission, not because they're trying to mislead, but just because it's a, a minor technical, uh, almost bureaucratic uh, oversight. That, that's not what this bill has in its sights, is it? Is it more about the more blatant, obvious, large-scale labelling fraud? It's about, it's about proportionality. Um, you know, so, you know, where it's very clear there has been an attempt or where there's a significant omission, there would be appropriate measures would then be uh, uh, taken and enforcement officers would expect it. So there's a level of discretion for enforcement officers to determine whether they think this is significant enough that they need to take some form of robust enforcement action. So... Um, uh, it's about uh, it's about achieving that balance. So, uh, in terms of how that's taken forward in practical terms, would be an operational matter for the FSS. Um, uh, but it's 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 not about you know um, uh, just trying to um, uh, you know pick up in small retailers who may have omitted one small point or idea. Um, uh, the problem is that if that one small point is a significant small point. Um, uh, then, Abdul, then clearly uh, that would reflect the response that they may get from the enforcement officer. You know, so that one small point may be that this says that it's got pork in it when it doesn't. It has, you know, uh, beef in it. So, you call it, it may just be one point, but it's a significant point. So, um, so there's a level of discretion there which enforcement officers would clearly use um, in considering any cases that are brought to them. So, for individuals in farmers markets, whether it's a small technical infringement. Um, I would expect um, enforcement officers to work on a proportionate basis. You know, I think it's fair just to put on the record when we spoke to enforcement officers from local authorities in a couple of different evidence sessions, they were very much taking the view that much of their role isn't necessarily enforcement, it's supporting compliance. Um, and I don't have any further questions, but I think that's just important to put on the record that that was teased out, and I think your evidence kind of backs up that, that approach. It should lay Thank you, Kandira. Can I ask you, it's just uh, come back into my mind. Um, I take it the FSS will still be based in Aberdeen and I uh, understand the head is moving to Australia. Uh, we'll be taking um, uh, the former head of the FSA. Um, we'll be uh, advertising for new staff and how many staff will be employed. And I take it there will be staff throughout the whole of the country based in different areas within Scotland. Can you give us a, a short resume of what's intended? So the, uh, the FSS will be based in Aberdeen at the FSA's uh, uh, headquarters um, uh, and uh, the half staff, for example, they've got their uh, uh, meat hygiene inspectors who are based in locations across the country. Um, they'll continue in that uh, basis. Um, Charles Milne, who's the director of the FSA in Scotland, is, uh, 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 is leaving us um, to go and work in Australia. Um, there will um, obviously be an interim arrangement which the FSA at a UK level will wish to put in place uh, with the establishment of the FSS and the process will be put in place for the appointment of a, a chief executive within the, uh, within the 
um, at the FSS, although the first important part is to get the board structure in place uh, and to get the board so that that process can uh, be taken forward. So there will be no reduction in staff and, and there may actually be... If, if Maybe an increase in staff. Well, that, that's the very point I was going to make, that, that there may be a, a possibility of an increase in staff to retain the, the high quality of food that Scotland uh, has a reputation for. Yeah, all, all the staff will transfer uh, to the FSS in line with the uh, Cabinet Office Agreement on these matters, which protects their pensions and all their other entitlements as well. So there will be no detriment to their terms and conditions uh, by the transfer. Um, and uh, there is no uh, need or plan to uh, reduce uh, FSS uh, staff numbers um, uh, in, in the creation of the body. And if anything, I would anticipate there is likely to be a need for a potential increase in some staff, depending on once the FSS set out their operational plans and how they intend to take their work forward. Thank you, Kevin. I don't see any other questions, but I think it would be remiss of, of the committee, the health committee, not saying something about the ambition of the new food, new food standards agency having uh, a greater influence on Scotland's problems in terms of diet, obesity, and, and others. At the same time, as bearing in mind all of these other bedding in issues about duplication and concerns from. Um, you know the retailers and suppliers, but um, you know, uh, you, do, does the minister want to put on the record that you know some of these ambitions about the food standards agency have the, having a greater influence on on, on the diet uh, and and the health of the Scottish population, and how we can achieve that by squaring off some of the retailers and some of the, you know some of the other concerns of manufacturing. So one of the uh, things that I've been very clear about in, uh, since the recommendation was made to establish a, 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 an independent food safety body in Scotland is to, uh, is to take an approach that allows us to maintain the integrity of the work that they undertake at the present moment without uh, potentially compromising uh, in any way. Uh, and that's why we've taken a what I would say is probably a, a relatively cautious approach because there have been a lot of organisations out there who have been saying we should, uh, the new body should do X, Y and Z in addition to it, um, uh, all of which may have a level of merit in it, but I think the danger is that you create a new body, move to a new body while adding a whole range of different functions they have to then undertake and you potentially then compromise some of its core responsibilities and its core responsibility in particular around consumer protection. So the approach I've chosen to take is one which is about protecting the integrity of the consumer protection work that they undertake, but to consider where we could add to uh, the role that they can play. And the issue around um, uh, diet and tackle and obesity is an area which the FSA at the present time feels as though they've got a greater role to play and contribute towards. And what we're doing with the legislation is facilitating that opportunity. It's not for them to necessarily take on this clear lead, but to allow them to work more clearly in a coordinated way with the other organisations who are involved in the sector, um, uh, with the NHS and other uh, uh, organisations who may have a role to play in the, uh, the obesity and uh, uh, dietary challenges that we face in uh, Scotland. So it's to give them that ability to take that role forward, which is one which the FSA feel is important and can be taken forward, and the FSS are going to be given that opportunity uh, to do that. But as I mentioned earlier on, we have tried to draft the legislation in a way which creates the footprint so that some of these other issues that have been raised uh, that the FSS could be, have responsibility for is that in going forward, if there is a good case to do so, and in considering that, we can consider adding those functions to the FSS uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the years to come. Um, I don't have any you know, preconceived idea it has to be X, Y and Z, but we wanted to create a body that could adapt and develop going forward as necessary. But I didn't want to get into a situation where we were adding lots of functions that potentially then compromised it and trying to get it self up and established and doing the bit which is important. And that is maintaining customer protection and public confidence in the role that they have in conducting that function, particularly given the importance of the food industry to, to Scotland. So uh, that's the approach I've chosen to take. Um, and uh, the legislation gives us a framework to add uh, as we go forward, as and when that's appropriate, and if, the, if there is a, a, a level of agreement that that's what we should do uh, for any particular functions it should undertake in the future. Okay. Um, I don't 
seem to have any further questions. Minister, thank you and your, uh, your officials for being with us this morning the evidence provided. Uh, we now move to agenda item number 10, which we previously agreed would be held in private. Thank you very much. Thank you.